Now, let's move into chapter 10. And we find out we've got another wonderful chapter before us. And we see here the injustice of life suggests the adoption of a very moderate course. Now, listen to this. Dead flies caused the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. You see, one night on the town can mean a lifetime in the darkness of the disease or of death. I could give you many examples. I had an officer in a church I served back east that said to me, he said, you know, I was brought up in a Christian home. He said, I never did really run around. But when I went away from home, got a job, I went out with the fellas one night. That's the only night in my life I went out. And that's the night I got a venereal disease. And he says, I had to postpone marriage several years. I had to break up an engagement with a sweet, lovely girl. (laughs) You know, just one dead fly will just ruin the ointment of the apothecary. Cause it to spoil. How tragic. A mother spends 21 years teaching a son to be wise, and some girl will come along and make a fool out of him in five minutes. Oh, what a picture. A little folly, just a little foolishness. That's all that it takes. And that is the thing that can ruin a life and spoil other lives. Now, verse 2, a wise man's heart is at his right hand, but a fool's heart is at his left. What does he mean here? Well, he means simply this. That, my friend, whatever you do with your hand, whatever you do, do it with heart. Don't do it reluctantly. If you're going to serve God, do it with joy and excitement. Don't make the Christian life a drag and a drudge. Make it something worthwhile or... Don't be using your hands so much. Whatever you do, do it with excitement. Verse 3, Yea, also, when he that is a fool walketh by the way, his wisdom faileth him, and he saith to every one that he's a fool. Now, he just doesn't go around carrying a placard on his, you know, self, saying, I am a fool. And the fact of the matter is, all he has to do is open his mouth. And sometimes he doesn't even have to open his mouth. And he's proven a fool. You can be in a meeting sometime, especially these meetings that are called by someone, you know, for the community. And you want to get a viewpoint. And you have several people get up there and you say, my, I didn't realize my neighbor was so intelligent. Then all of a sudden, some fella gets up. And the minute he opens his mouth, you look at your friend next to you, and you know, arch your eyebrow, there's another one. He's a fool. (laughs) That's what the Bible calls him. We're not to call a man a fool, but that's what the Bible says he is. A fool's heart is always at his left hand, and also the fool is one that, say, he tells everybody what he is. Now, verse 4, if the spirit of the ruler rise up against thee, leave not thy place for yielding pacifieth great offenses. In other words, if you can't fight City Hall, then join. That's exactly what the man under the sun's going to do. Now, will you notice? Verse 5, There is an evil which I have seen under the sun as an error which proceedeth from the ruler. Folly is set in great dignity, and the rich sit in low place. And one of the things that's happened in our day, in particular, is the dignity that's been given to sin. There was a time that sin was down the side street, and it was dirty, was filthy. And it savored of that which was low and foul. But today, sin has moved up on the boulevard. And it's done with great dignity. It's given a very prominent place. And on a TV show where they 
have these foolish interviews. My, there's nothing today that is such a waste of time as listening to these interviews, interviewing the so-called great or the oddballs. And it looks like everybody on these are oddballs. And I noticed one the other day. It had on it a stripper. That is, a girl takes off her clothes in a nightclub. And my, it was called an art form. But when I was a young fellow growing up in my teens, and I was away from God then, I can tell you that, in Detroit, where we snuck off on Saturday night. And it wasn't any art form. It was dirty. It was filthy. (laughs) Today it's an art form. Oh, how sin is handled in such a dignified way today. And the thing is that folly is set in great dignity, and the rich sit in a low place. The thing about it is that a man that is a prominent man in the community, actually the man that probably makes the finest contribution, do they ever put him, the ordinary citizen, the ordinary Christian, is he ever interviewed today? No, he occupies a low place. You never hear of him. He's never written up. It's always oddballs. It's always those that are way out in left field. They are the ones that receive the attention today. Now listen to this. I have seen servants upon horses and princes walking as servants upon the earth. What a picture that you have here. To work hard and save your money and study late does not mean that you'll always become a success. Why, the fool next door to you may inherit a million dollars, friends. That's the thing that happens today. And how many fools, men that have some odd thing, and they are the ones riding on horses. And I know many wonderful Christians Oh, across this land, I've had the privilege of meeting some of the most wonderful people. And you know, they're humble folk. Many of them live in humble homes. Some of them are prominent, by the way, in the sense that they're well-to-do. But they're absolutely ignored. They're walking as servants upon the earth. What a picture. And verse 8, He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh a hedge a serpent shall bite him. And today, if you think you can sin and get by with it, especially if you're a child of God, you are very foolish because all you've got to wait and God will take care of it. I've watched that over the years. I've watched a Christian that has done things that's wrong. And they never got by with it. Somewhere down the line, God began to move in on them and he took them to the woodshed. Now will you notice, whoso removeth stone shall be hurt therewith, and he that cleaveth wood shall be endangered thereby. And removing stones, these were markers for the property. To remove those would mean that actually whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Whatever you're going to do in the way of sin, if you sow to the flesh, you will of the flesh reap corruption. And you can depend on that, my friend. And that's the reason the Lord says to us today, avenge not yourselves. I will repay, saith the Lord. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. You turn it over to God, he'll see to it that the thing is straightened out. Then we find here, if the iron be blunt and he do not whet the edge, then must he put to more strength. But wisdom is profitable to direct. If the hole gets dull, if you have any sense at all, you'll sharpen it because it's going to make it harder to dig with it. And how many people today are not willing to do the thing to sharpen the hole? I said to a young man the other day, God's called him to preach and he wants to take a short course. And I said, oh, young man, don't do that. Sharpen your hole. Sharpen your sword. And don't go out untrained. Take time for that. It's very foolish to take a dull hole and expect to cut out a bunch of weeds. Sharpen the hole, then move in. 
My, may I say to you, there's some great lessons to be learned in the book of Ecclesiastes. Unusual book. Now he says here in Ecclesiastes 10:11, Surely the serpent will bite without enchantment, and a babbler is no better. Now, we'd have to understand a practice of the East if we are going to understand this verse. And therefore, you have back in the Psalms, in Psalm 58, you have a reference here to the serpent and to the way that he operates. And here you have in Psalm 58, verses 4 and 5, their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They are like the deaf adder that stoppeth her ear, which will not hearken to the voice of charmers, charming never so wisely. Now, what he's saying here is the same thing that we have here in Ecclesiastes, is this, that the adder is a very deadly reptile, as you know. And you have seen these Indian fakers, and I think you could spell that both ways. They spell it F-A-K-I-R, that a faker is one that has a little horn, and he plays a tune on that, a very doleful sort of a tune. And the adder, you know, does a sort of a dance, what would be called an adder hula dance. And the adder will not strike while that little horn is being blown. And I don't know about you, but if I had a horn and the adder came along, I'd become a pretty long-winded person. I think I'd play it for a long time. But there is a time when an adder will not listen to that, and he'll strike. And when he does, it means death. Now, we find over in the prophecy of Jeremiah another reference to that in Jeremiah 8, verse 17. God says, For behold, I will send serpents, cockatrices among you, which will not be charmed, and they shall bite you, saith the Lord. And what he's talking about here, I don't think really is literal snakes. Could be, but I don't think so. I think that he's going to send these that will deceive you. A babbler, one that will betray you. A Judas Iscariot. And after all, that's what Antichrist will be to the nation Israel in the Great Tribulation period. And today, in the church, you find that sometimes you're betrayed by someone. They talk, and they should not talk. And they say things that are not true. And what he's saying here, surely the serpent shall bite without enchantment, and a babbler's no better. He may be your friend. You may try to win him over. But he's going to bite you like a serpent. And no matter how nice you are to him. And we saw that also in the 55th Psalm, when David had a clear reference there to Ahithophel, his counselor, who turned against him, who'd been his personal friend, and he went with his son Absalom. And that broke David's heart. I think David was a broken man after the rebellion of Absalom up to that time. There's probably no ruler like David. But after that, he becomes an old man. And this is the picture that you have here. Now, in view of that, then you should be very careful. That is exactly what he's saying here. Try to be the good man. And I would say that's the philosophy of life of the average person today. They say, now, you want to be very careful with Mr. So-and-so or Miss So-and-so. I've had that told me many times. Be careful what you say in their presence because they'll twist it and turn it. And the idea is that you adopt a sweet attitude toward them but be careful what you say. This is a middle-of-the-road position. Now, maybe somebody ought to start killing snakes. Maybe somebody ought to take these folk aside and talk with them. Or maybe somebody ought to point them out as to what they are. Now, I know from experience you're going to be in trouble if you point them out. Why, you'll be attacked in the most vicious manner. And lies, the like of which you never heard, will be told about you. So that this is a tremendous statement here, by the way, and I've dwelt upon it. Now, will you notice 
Verse 12, "...the words of a wise man's mouth are gracious, but the lips of a fool will swallow up himself." And those around him, too, by the way. And this is something that person needs to be very careful about. You need to have the right kind of friends. Be very careful about making friends. When I taught in school, I always warned the freshman class. I said, you're going to make friends here that will go with you through life. You may even meet your mate here, and some of them, of course, did. And be careful who you make your friends. My daughter went away to college. That was the advice that I gave her. I said, now, you're going to have the greatest opportunity you've ever had in your life. I'm making some wonderful friends. Just be careful who they are. Because I said, some of them will try to destroy you. And in other words, just like a serpent, like an adder. And as long as you're nice to them, why, my, you got them charmed. (laughs) But you better be careful of the way that... You act in their presence. This is good advice, friends, but it's a middle-of-the-road course, as you can see. Now he says, "...the beginning of the words of his mouth is foolishness, and the end of his talk is mischievous madness." And how true that is. Verse 14, "...a fool also is full of words. A man cannot tell what shall be, and what shall be after him who can tell it." Have you ever noticed that generally when you have a group and if you throw it open to have an open session, you can call it anything that you want to, a rap session. We called it when I was young, a bull session. Generally in that group, you find some loquacious person, some person given to gab, and they will say the most foolish, absurd things, ridiculous things. And it's always something, and you feel like, my, they just keep their mouth shut. That's one of the reasons that I never encourage that in meetings. When I have a question-answer period, I've always asked the people to write it out. Because if you don't, you're going to get someone standing up who comes under this category. And they're going to be troublemakers, babblers, just talkers, and the brain doesn't go along with it. Someone has said that there are some people, their brain starts their mouth to working, and then the brain goes off and leaves it. And that seems to be true. Now, let's continue to move along. Verse 15, "...the labor of the foolish wearieth every one of them, because he knoweth not how to go to the city." We would say today he doesn't even know how to get in out of the rain. Verse 16, Woe to thee, O land, when thy king is a child, and thy princess eat in the morning. That is, they give themselves over to pleasure and not to ruling the people or being a blessing to the land. And then he says, Blessed art thou, O land, when the king is the son of nobles, and thy princess eat in due season for strength and not for drunkenness. I would say today that big problem in this country is not drugs, but drink. It's liquor. Now our alcoholics number in the millions. I don't think you can get an accurate figure today because I don't think the liquor interests would permit that. They do too much advertising for the news media to give out accurate figures there. But it's alarming. And the problem today is there are too many cocktail parties in Washington. That's the real difficulty. It's unfortunate that this is the picture that is presented today. Now let me move on. In verse 18, "...by much slothfulness the building decayeth, and through idleness of the hands the house droppeth through." In other words, laziness, refusal to work. All of this is quite modern, you see, as a nation today. Our main way of greeting is, "...take it easy." Have a good day. (laughs) In other words, let's do as little as we can, have as much fun as we can. Verse 19, a feast is made for laughter. And wine maketh merry, but money answereth all things. That's something, if you're going to follow the middle of the road, remember to have plenty of money. And actually, I think today the rich have moved to the middle of the road. That's the ground that they want to take. They want to be liberal, 
and they want to be conservative. It's the middle of the road. Verse 20, curse not the king, no, not in thy fault, and curse not the rich in thy bedchamber. For a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter, and you'll be in trouble. I am of the opinion that I do not get support from a great many rich men who support Christian projects simply because of the fact that I try to teach the Word of God, and the Word of God does not curry favor to the rich. I do not pat them on the back. I never did as a pastor. And I thank God I can say today and say for the radio program, God always raises up someone and a whole lot of someones because a great many organizations depend on one or two men today to do the supporting. This program, no church I ever served, depended on one or two men. I can say that today because that's important to say, my friend. And we need to recognize that. And again, this verse tells me something else. Curse not the king. I do not believe that a president, regardless of who he is or what party he is, that he should be caricatured, that he should be made an object of ridicule, or that he have imitators. I have felt all the way long, and each president has had a comedian that makes big money just imitating him. I think it's wrong. I think it's very wrong. Now, I know that that will not set well with a great many, but after all, we're teaching the Bible, friend, I hope you'll understand that. Now, as we come to chapter 11 here, here is the best course to follow for the do-gooder, for the moral man, for the man that wants to live the good life, that today wants to be neither hot nor cold, neither right nor left, but go down the middle. Here it is. Cast thy bread upon the waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Don't be afraid of doing good, although the reward may be late in arriving. If your policy in life is to be a do-gooder, don't look for a reward. You may not get it as you go along. Give a portion to seven and also to eight, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. In other words, be sure and don't help just one. Help quite a few because you may get in trouble yourself and may want to turn to them. You remember the Lord Jesus gave a parable along that line about the crooked steward, the dishonest steward. Then verse 3, if the clouds be full of rain, they empty themselves upon the earth. And if the tree fall toward the south or toward the north in the place where the tree falleth, there it shall be. Now, rain is predicted. Carry an umbrella. It's hard to move a redwood after it falls. It's always best to have a clear understanding in the beginning, you see, before you launch a venture, because after it begins, it's very difficult to make any change, you see. Now, he says, verse 4, "...he that observeth the wind shall not sow, and he that regardeth the clouds shall not reap." In other words... You go on and carry through your program because you can't always tell about the weather. Verse 5, As thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child, even so thou knowest not the works of God who maketh all. Now, even today, this matter of physical birth is still a great mystery. And you do not know how the Spirit will move. And the Lord Jesus said that. He said, The wind bloweth where it listed. Thou hearest the sound thereof. Thou canst not tell whither it cometh, where it's going. You just cannot figure that out. And therefore, there's a great deal we don't know today. But I think great teaching is just simply this. Don't let what you don't know disturb what you do know. Now, any person knows enough to go and sit in a chair there's a chair right here in my study, empty. I wouldn't mind moving over and sitting in it. And there's a lot I don't know about chairs. I don't know about the wood. I don't know about what went in it, how it was made, or who made it, or anything. But I know enough that if I sit in it, it'll hold me up. And that's all I need to know. Don't let what you don't know disturb what you do know. Verse 7, Truly the light is sweet, and a pleasant thing it is for the eyes to behold the sun. 
But if a man live many years and rejoice in them all, yet let him remember the days of darkness, for they shall be many. All that cometh is vanity. In other words, you're going to get old, my friend. Actually, life for a senior citizen is not all that the folders say it's going to be. Now, he launches into the section in which we're going to conclude next time the book of Ecclesiastes. Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth. Let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart and in the sight of thine eyes. But know thou that for all these things God will bring thee into judgment. Remember, young man, that now is the time to make your decisions in every category of life. It's very important that you make the right choices. How many men are living wasted lives today because it all began in their youth? Now, he's going to talk about old age in the next chapter. And verse 10 that closes this says, "...therefore remove sorrow from thy heart, and put away evil from thy flesh." For childhood and youth are vanity. They're empty if you don't use it right. Life is a gift that's given to us, given to us a day at a time, in fact, a second at a time. And it's a very precious gift, by the way. God doesn't give it to you in one big bunch. And you're to use it, and we are to use it for His glory. What is the chief end of man? The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. We are rejoicing today in this very wonderful book that presents a pessimistic viewpoint of life. Now, we have seen that Solomon has made an experiment in life. Probably the only man who's ever lived who would be able to experiment in all of these different areas. And he has attempted to find a solution and satisfaction to life apart from God. The key expression was under the sun. He tried nature, natural science, what we'd call natural science today. There are a great many folk that think, well, if you just get back to nature, we'd solve all of our problems. Well, I'm sure it would be helpful There's a great exodus out of the city, even from suburbia today. That's become an unhealthy place to live. And people now are trying to find a little cabin by a lake or on a river or up in the mountains. And let's get away from it. I'll get back to nature. Well, it didn't solve the problem for Solomon and won't solve it for you or me. And they had problems back in the day when they were living by rivers, and it wasn't as complicated as it is today. But you don't find a solution under the sun. Then there's wisdom and philosophy. There was pleasure. Then materialism, living for the now, and fatalism. You can do nothing about it, so just keep going. Egoism, that is, live for self. And then religion, religion that has a lot of ritual but no reality. And then wealth. And, of course, today, there are a great many people have made the almighty dollar their God, and that's modern idolatry, covetousness. We're told in Scriptures, idolatry. And then morality, and we've been looking at that the past two or three times. That is the good life, the middle of the roader, the man that wants to do good, you know. And believe me, that sometimes leads to a very insipid sort of a life. And I'm of the opinion the rebellion we've had of youth has been more against that than anything else that we've had. They see how Papa and Mama are living. They live a life of taking the middle of the road, not offending anybody and trying to be sweet and nice and do good and still chasing the almighty dollar and Actually, their Christianity, though they might belong to a Bible church, is as phony as a $3 bill, and youth has rebelled against that. I don't blame them for that, but I don't think they've found the solution at all to life. They certainly have not. 
Now, we come here to the final conclusion that he made. And the final conclusion we have here in chapter 12. And we have here a poetic picture of old age, but it's not a pretty picture at all. And today our message, I think, will have something for youth and something for the senior citizen. Both ends of the spectrum of life today. And they say there's no communication between these groups, that there is a gap here. Well, there's not a gap in the Word of God. And now he says, as he begins this, in view of these things not satisfying, get to God. Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Now, while you're young, make your decisions. And it'll be quite obvious why. Now he gives the picture, your picture, my picture in old age. And friends, some of us have reached that. I remember the first time that I preached on the 12th chapter of Ecclesiastes. I was a very young preacher, and I wondered, if it would be like this. I'm here to testify today that the book of Ecclesiastes in the 12th chapter is quite accurate of old age. Now, I want you to notice this, that it's very, very important to see. And he's going to answer the statement of the liberal who says, I believe in a religion of the here and now, not a religion of the hereafter. Well, here's a religion of the here, and that means to be rightly related to God. Now, God has something for you here and for the hereafter. And one is, of course, to live to him. Why? Well, he says here, first of all, and I want you to get the picture here, for it is, I think, a tremendous picture. He says, while the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. Now, what is it that's happened? Well, this is a picture now of old age, and I must confess it's not as pretty as you might hope it would be. What does he mean that the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened? You mean that they are going out? No, my friend, your eyesight won't be so good. You may have to do like I do, use trifocals. And time flies. And one sad experience follows another. The clouds return after the rain. Yes, you can go out and have a great day, but believe me, you've got to take three or four days to rest up. I've learned that. I used to go out in conferences and just enjoy it and keep going. Clouds, they do return after the rain, by the way. And the sun and the moon and the star out in Hawaii... My wife and I took a walk, and it was a full moon. And, you know, I said to her, my, isn't that a beautiful moon and that? And I said to her, I said, you know, it doesn't seem as romantic as it did once. How do you feel? And she says, no, I don't think that it's as romantic as it once was. I used to think, she says, the Hawaiian Islands was the most romantic place in the world. Well, my friends... You get old, I want to tell you that. Now, verse 3. In the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble. Now, what are the keepers of the house? Now, he's talking about your physical body from here on. Keep that in mind. What are the keepers of the house that shall tremble? That's your legs. I was telling a friend of mine the other day, I said, you know, my staff and some of my close friends, they try to kid me and say, oh, you are looking so good. You're looking well and all that sort of thing. And I said, yet when I get in a car, get out of the car, I find somebody at my elbow helping me. They assist me in and assist me out. You know why? Because I don't do it quite as fast as I once did. And these legs of mine, I find out when I get up of a morning, and come down the steps. Oh, I groan. My wife gets after me. Why do you groan? I says, it's scriptural. Paul says, in these bodies we groan. 
and I want to be scriptural, and I'm going to groan because the knees hurt when you come down the steps, friends. The keepers of the house shall tremble. And I find out I stumble more than I used to. have to be a little more careful when I climb up a ladder. The old person today gets him a walking stick. I've been thinking about that too, by the way. What a picture. Then notice something else. And I'll be very personal here. There was a time I couldn't be personal, but I can right now. It says here, "...in the days when the keepers of the house shall tremble, and the strong men shall bow themselves." Now, what's the strong man? Well, that's your shoulders. My wife said to me the other day, she said, "...you'd look lots better if you'd stand erect like you used to." She said, "...when you were young, you had broad shoulders, and now look at you. You're all stooped over." Well, friends, the strong men are bowing themselves. They don't stay back like they once did. Their shoulders begin to round off, and it's more comfortable to be that way, I can assure you. And then, and the grinders cease because they're few. My friend, may I say to you, this says that you're going to lose your teeth, by the way. The grinders are going to cease because they're few. You'll have to have a few bridges put in. I haven't kept. Now, I haven't had to resort yet to false teeth. I'm thankful I have my own, but they're all kept, by the way. And they have been for several years. But the grinders cease because they're few. And then notice this. Those that look out of the windows be darkened. (laughs) Don't see as well in a restaurant man came up to me and shook hands and began to talk. And I talked with that man two minutes before I even recognized who he was. Couldn't place him. And I met a friend. We were in a meeting. I was with my wife, shook hands. And after the friend left, why, I said to my wife, who was that? She said, so-and-so. You mean to tell me you didn't know him and you've known him for years? And I said, tell the truth, I didn't know him. I said, I think he's changed. She says, yes, I think he has, but you have also. You see, the thing that was happened, those that look out of the windows be darkened. It doesn't look quite as bright as it once did. Now, verse 4, notice this. The doors shall be shut in the street. And what does that mean? Well, that means you're going to get hard of hearing again. My wife tells friends, she doesn't think I even hear her when she says this. She says, you'll have to speak a little louder. He's getting hard of hearing. And I'm not, by the way. I don't think I'm getting hard of hearing. She says, I don't hear her often. Well, frankly, I just don't want to hear her. I had a neighbor several years ago, and this neighbor wore a hearing device. And his wife would get after him when he got out to trim trees or prune his fruit trees or do things like that. And she'd come out and he'd be up on a ladder and she'd be rebuking him for it. And all he did would take out his hearing aid. He didn't hear a word she said. And all of a sudden, after she'd talked to him for 15 minutes, she said, I don't think that you got your hearing aid in. And he didn't have. He just kept right on working, you see. Well, the noise out in the street. It's not as loud as it once was. The doors are shut in the streets. And then it says, when the sound of the grinding is low. And actually, the literal here is the sound of the grinding women. The sound of the grinding women is low. What does that refer to? It refers to the tongue, to the voice. Have you ever noticed that sometimes when... People get very old, the voice gets low, and they begin to talk. Well, you know, I'm getting old. (laughs) Yes, we are friends. And when we start talking like that, we better get off the radio. And if I get to that point, you won't hear me on the radio. The sound of the grinding women is low. It refers to the tongue and the voice. Now, will you notice this? And he shall rise up at the voice of the bird. You remember when you and I were younger, that why even an alarm clock in the morning didn't wake us up. 
and we didn't mind the noise of children or we didn't mind the noise of music coming from next door or when you're in a motel from the next room. Well, now, even the little chirp of a bird disturbs us. And I find that one of the things in motels today, I always ask, can you give us a quiet room? Why? Well, I want you to know very candidly that the sound of a chirp of a bird is disturbing at night. And we want to get our rest and our sleep. And then, will you notice something else? And the daughters of music shall be brought low. Now, it means that the daughters of music are brought low. It means you cannot sing in the choir any longer. It means that you can't carry a tune anymore. And I remember their brother Homer Rody Heaver. What a marvelous music director he was, song leader. And I remember him as a young man. I was a boy, and I went to hear Billy Sunday. My, how he thrilled me, played the trombone, led the singing. What a voice. And then I had him when I was pastor in downtown Los Angeles. He was in his 70s. I'd have to help him up. He was tottering up to the platform. And he still was a marvelous song leader. No one, I think, could ever excel him. But every now and then, he'd sing a stanza. And my feeling was he should have read this verse because he got to the place where it wasn't the same old roadie. It wasn't that glorious voice that we'd heard. And there are a lot of folk today that ought to realize they can't sing anymore. Now, he could get by with it because he was great whether he could sing or not. But there are a lot of folk not great, and therefore they ought to quit singing. And that's the reason I never opened my mouth today in a song service. I don't dare. I couldn't sing when I was young, and it's frightful now. The daughters of music shall be brought low. Now he continues on as he speaks of old age, and now to me it gets to the place where it's tragic because we are looking at the psychological effects. And here is one of them, verse 5. Also, when they shall be afraid of that which is high. Things that formerly did not frighten us. And I was just getting so, I was enjoying flying. And then old age slipped upon me. And I find today I have the same old fear of flying that I had at the very beginning. Little things, you see, like that, that one time never disturbed us. They do disturb us now. That's a picture of old age. And fears shall be in the way. In other words, we don't enjoy traveling as we once did. That is something that, to me, is quite interesting today because we take many tours. We've taken them to Bible lands We've taken them to Hawaii, and we've had folk going with us. And I have noticed as friends get older, they find traveling much more difficult. That's the thing that we're finding today. These things become a burden, you see. Fears shall be in the way. You wonder about things you never even thought of before. I never even worried when I've traveled by car in the old days, start out in an old jalopy across the country, never have a reservation, wouldn't need it, wouldn't worry me. If I went to a motel and asked for a room, they say we have failed, didn't bother me a bit. And my wife and I had to sleep on the side of the road, been all right in that day. But my friend, today there's always that fear. What a picture that we have here. Now, he says, and the almond tree shall flourish. The almond tree shall flourish means that the almond branch, by the way, when it buds, is white. And it means that the senior citizen is going to turn white on top, or there won't be anything on top. It'll be one or the other, getting gray hair. And if his hair hasn't fallen out, it'll turn gray. Now will you notice, and the grasshopper shall be a burden. How can a grasshopper be a burden? Little things will annoy you that did not annoy you before. You even you love your grandchildren. You love to have them with you, but after they've been with you a while, you're glad to see them go home because what 
Well, let's move on down. He says here, And the grasshopper shall be a burden, and desire shall fail. Romance is gone. Now, you can act as if you're just as young as you were. I remember listening to an evangelist that married a young girl, and he hopped on the platform, in fact, jumped in the air and says, I'm just as young as I ever was. He wasn't fooling anybody but himself, because he died shortly after that. Desire shall fail, because man goeth to his long home. And that long home is eternity, and the mourners go about the street. Now, will you notice verse 6 here? Now, we're talking about the organs of the body or ever the silver cord be loosed. Now, the silver cord is a spinal cord. The golden bowl here be broken, and the golden bowl is the head. And you get a little touched in the head when you start getting old. Or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, and the pitcher's the lungs. And then notice, and the wheel broken at the cistern. No longer pumping blood through the body. That's the heart, you see. Die of one of these diseases that affect these organs. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God that gave it. There's no soul sleep. I wish these who use a verse or two back out of the ninth chapter to try to support the doctrine of soul sleep would now come to this verse. There is no soul sleep. The body sleeps, but the spirit of soul goes to God. The spirit shall return to God who gave it. And for the child of God, today when you come to the New Testament, Paul says it's absent from the body. This body is a tabernacle we live in. And as President Adams years ago, somebody met him on the street, says, how are you getting along? Oh, he says, I'm doing fine. But this house I live in is growing very feeble, and I think I'll be moving out before long. That was true. He did move out shortly after that. Verse 8, Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, all is vanity. Life is empty if you're just living for the here and now, young man. You're going to find out one day that all you've got in your hands is a bunch of ashes, and you've got eternity ahead of you. And this is the picture, therefore. And what a picture it is. And we can put it like this. When as a child I laughed and wept, time crept. When as a youth I dreamed and talked, time walked. When I became a full-grown man, time ran. When older still I daily grew, time flew. Soon I shall find in traveling on, time gone. And the psalmist could say, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom, and that wisdom is Jesus Christ. That's the thing that is important. Or someone has put it in this whimsical way today. Thou knowest, Lord, I'm growing older. My fire of youth begins to smolder. I somehow tend to reminisce and speak of good old days I miss. I am more moody, bossy, and think folk should jump at my command. Help me, Lord, to conceal my aches and realize my own mistakes. Keep me sweet, silent, sane, serene, instead of crusty, sour, and mean. What a picture, growing old gracefully. The thing that he's saying here is this, the moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge, Yea, he gave good heed and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. The words of the wise are as goads, and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. We should not despise the wisdom of the past by any means. And further, by these my son be admonished, of making many books there is no end, and much study is awareness of the flesh. And wisdom, education, does not solve the problems of life. What is it? Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth. Why? Well, for a very definite reason. 
because in the matter of salvation, your chances of being saved are greater. And in the subject of service, you will have something to offer to God. Statistics show that more come to Christ when they're young. If you're 80 and you are listening to this program, your chance of being saved is about nil. But it's not impossible. We've had a man down in San Diego, 90 years old, when we gave an invitation for those that want to accept Christ to put up a hand. His daughter walked into the room, and there he sat in a rocking chair listening to us with his hand in the air. You can be saved. But men that have had service, something to give to God, why, they have been young men, Joseph and Moses and Gideon and David and Jeremiah and Saul of Tarsus and Timothy and we Bobby Moffat, the great missionary to Africa, and all others we could name. What a picture this is. My friend, there's no answer to the problems of life under the sun today. And that's the reason education and government and the military and the scientists has no solution for the problems of life. Only Jesus Christ has the solution. Why not turn to him today? He says, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out.